It wasn't that long ago. People were saying, listen, just pray your way through it. But if you've got a biochemistry problem, I don't care how much you're praying. You hear what I'm saying? God's saying, hey, listen, the answer is right down the street. Go see your local doctor. Welcome to Babel Undone, a podcast created by Premier in partnership with Archbishop Joseph D'Souza and the Good Shepherd Church of India. Bishop D'Souza is a renowned Christian intellectual and civil rights activist from India who leads the Good Shepherd Movement and the All India Christian Council. And I'm Johnny Moore, an American evangelical who serves as the president of the Congress of Christian Leaders and JDA Worldwide. We live in an interconnected world where the questions are complex. So on every episode of Babel Undone, Bishop D'Souza and I aim to bring the global church together in conversation about an important issue facing everyone. And we do it from different perspectives. Bishop comes from the East and I come from the West. So naturally, we meet in London. Um, Bishop, what's our subject today? (laughs) The enormous issue and challenge of mental health. Johnny, the world is finally shedding the stigma associated with mental health care. Thankfully, many Christian leaders are paving the way in demonstrating how we take care of ourselves before we take care of others. Yet as Christians, we know we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of darkness. Today, we're going to tackle the critical element of faith when it comes to addressing a mental health crisis in our homes, our churches, our schools, our children, and elsewhere. And our guest, Bishop, is a lifelong friend of mine. His name is Dr. Tim Clinton. Uh, He is probably the Christian expert in the world in this field. He's the president of the American Association of Christian Counselors, the largest Christian counseling organization in the world, and actually one of the largest professional organizations of any type in the United States. Uh, He also hosts a weekly television program called The Road Forward. He's not only an expert at the intersection of faith and mental health, uh, he's someone who's impacted the lives quietly behind the scenes of countless people who are among the most influential people in my country and in the entire world. He is a pioneer when it comes to the intersection of faith and mental health, and now he's joining us on Babel Undone. Uh, so, Dr. Clinton, our audience is uh, global. Uh, that means that there are uh, You know, Christians who may be listening to us in a small town in Africa or in Southeast Asia uh, who who may not know Dr. Tim Clinton and the way way we know you. And so I I always like to begin these conversations with a a very simple question, and you can be as practical or as metaphysical as you want to be in answering it. And here's the question. Who is Tim Clinton? Johnny, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And Bishop, what a delight to meet you. Um, it's uh, a joy for me to join the two of you. You know, if you uh, step back, I guess I'd love to describe myself, first of all, as uh, uh, a dad and a grandpa, a papa. And uh, I love our family. Um, my wife, Julie, and I have two children, um, Megan and Zach, and uh, they're both married. And we have two grandchildren. Olivia and Sophia, the joy of our life. And so the older I get, the more I like to be identified as uh, a dad and a papa. But hey, professionally speaking, I'm a licensed professional counselor um, uh, in the state of Virginia. I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. I've been involved in the counseling movement for um, quite a few years. Uh, It goes all the way back to when I graduated out of my master's degree from Liberty University And then I went on to earn my doctorate in counselor education from the College of William and Mary uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia, which was, by the way, a joyful experience for me. And God just uh, opened up an opportunity for me to get involved in not only mental health education at Liberty University, but also in helping build an organization called the American Association of Christian Counselors. And God has allowed us to build, I think, the world's premier faith-based mental health organization where God has brought together an aggregate of what I call the entire community of care, from psychiatrists, which are medical doctors who are trained with a uh, specialization, if you will, in mental health, and all the way down to um, coaches, people who um, are out there. They see themselves in that positivity type of uh, movement, and they want to help encourage people to aspire to and accomplish reaching their goals. And so it's been a joy. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a kid who grew up in the heart of central Pennsylvania. My dad was a kind of a rural 
country pastor, kind of a circuit rider, had three small churches, but uh, had a deep love for the Lord and really loved people. And God put that seed, I guess, in my heart. Hopefully that gets us on a, a little bit of discussion on where we want to go as we talk about mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, uh, Tim for that story. And uh, when Johnny told me we are going to be interviewing you, I said, what a brilliant thing to do because uh, uh, you don't need to be told that mental health and mental crisis has exploded all over the world. And uh, COVID created its own massive mental health problems all over the world, which people are struggling. And then, of course, you know that poverty and oppression creates a disproportionate percentage of people struggling with uh, mental health issues. And because I'm dealing with the oppressed and the Dalits and hundreds of, I mean, just to see this issue and that that there are a group of Christians who are trying to address this and making the connection between the body, the mind, and the spirit. So so I'm amazed that, that you're doing. If I were to ask you, uh, in terms of Christian openness and understanding of it, is there a more compassionate understanding and openness today in the U.S. than before? Have, have the cases of pastor suicide or Rick Warren's son's death and so many other things, has it heightened awareness that this is not all spiritual, that we are complex human persons, and people in the church and all of us have to address this, otherwise the suffering in the world is only going to increase. Bishop, I'm I'm so glad that you uh, raised that. Yes, I would say um, 100% yes. Uh, the narrative here in the States has gone to a different place. It's not where I want it to be, but we certainly are making progress. Uh, One of the cornerstones of who we are as an organization is to help bring awareness around mental health to the church, big C, uh, not only here but around the globe, so people understand that there may be a lot of factors that play into clinical depression or anxiety or obsessive-compulsive disorder or any other related uh, challenge that people wrestle with and are are seeking help or hope for. Uh, Bishop, you know as well as I do, uh, it wasn't wasn't that long ago people were saying, listen, just pray your way through it. We get the value of prayer. But if you've got a biochemistry problem, I don't care how much you're praying. You hear what I'm saying? Something, uh, God's saying, hey, listen, the answer is right down the street. Go see your local doctor and uh, get this thing dealt with. You know that? Um, that is where we're going. And as we bring awareness, we also want to bring access to care. We want to help connect people who are hurting with people who actually provide meaningful care. Ultimately, how do we see ourselves? We see ourselves anchored in what it means to grow up in Christ. I see counseling as a part of discipleship. I don't see it separate from the body of Christ. I see it anchored in the heart of who we are in Christ. And so we're on a journey to be free. Galatians 5.1, it's for freedom that Christ has come to set us free. Kiss the Son and you'll be free indeed. The problem is so many people are stuck in bondage and challenge and oppression. And by the way, growing up in violence and abuse and more that they get lost and they can't see very well. And then, then it begins to just affect how they think and how they process and how they live out their everyday lives. And so here's the good news. The good news is that as we learn and grow together, people are being set free. People are seeing what it means to live and become alive in Christ and to have brothers and sisters who come alongside of you and say, hey, listen, I've been there. I know what you're going through. I know it's dark, but there's hope and there's a brighter tomorrow. And guess what? God is in the midst of it. Yeah. He's in the midst of it. He's in the midst of it. You know, it's it's interesting that for many years there was like this divide, right? So there were people in the church that said, um, you know, it's the the Bible has the solution to all of your problems, and that opposed um, 
you know, a, a, a medical approach to, uh, to counseling and to, and, and to mental health. You know, and then on the other side, you had all these uh, secularist um, scientists and, and researchers who are, who are like, it's all, you know, it's all, it, it, the one thing it isn't is it has nothing to do with faith. You know, it's, it's, all, it's bio, all biochemical or medical. And yet we, we seem to have a revolution that's taking place. It seems like there's more research coming from secular institutions which says, like, faith has something to say in this conversation. And in the faith community, it's like... You know, if you have cancer, go see your doctor, you know, and it seems like we're reaching this sort of magical moment where the research is affirming faith and faith is becoming more open minded. And the net effect is that people are getting better more quickly. Johnny, I love that, too. And let me say this. I I ultimately believe the Bible does have the answer. Uh, Our hope is in him. Hope thou in God. Hey, why is my soul cast down? Hey, look to God at the core of who we are as faith-based mental health providers. Our hope is in God. We're going to anchor ourselves there, and then we're going to, you know, really push ourselves to understand what's going on. We're not, not going to ignore the factors that feed and that, quote, fester, and, and, and how we navigate and work our way through that. But ultimately, we're going to go to our freedom in Christ. You bet. There is no hope, ultimately, in my mind, apart from that. Here's what's exciting to me is you, you look at all the uh, amazing, massive amount of research that's coming out now uh, by leaders like Harold Koenig out of Duke University uh, in North Carolina. Uh, you'll see that there's a high correlation between mental health and faith. Um, people who are anchored in there, Tyler Vanderwill, professor at Harvard, uh, known for his work around human flourishing. If you look at the pieces that help people flourish. You're going to see faith, religion, right in the middle of it. We all know there's toxic religion, but I'm talking about a meaningful, vibrant relationship with God and participating in religious um, activities, how that actually will impact your mental health. And so, you know, I go to Philippians 4 uh, in the Bible. Uh, Paul said, be anxious for nothing. That's a hard thing to do, When the wheels are coming off, bills are going unpaid, kids are out of control, your marriage is a mess, and so much more. But he prefaces that by saying, let your confidence be known to everyone. In other words, God is there. He's in the midst of it. You're anchored up into him. And so when you press into God and who he is, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and more, You have hope, and hope deferred makes the heart sick, but we know hope is a person, and so we reconcile these two worlds together in a beautiful way that I hopefully believe brings a a beautiful offering, a gift of grace to people in their darkest moments. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, Christian counseling and efforts, psychiatry, etc., um, within a Christian context, you know, it's amazing how it's developing our Christians. You know, I live in India where mental challenges and diseases and problems are among the many non-Christians. Uh, whether they are Muslims or faith or no faith, etc. And Having a team of Christian counselors who understand the unity of the person, human person, and trying to reach out to them, not from the religious side, because unfortunately some Christians have messed up the playing playing field, as you said. Fast and pray, you'll get better. And so they fast and pray and nothing happens. Or you got, got the other extreme. No, this is demonic, so we have to cast out the demo, uh, demon here. I, I, in our early early part of my work, I, I, I've seen that firsthand. I said, boy, this doesn't make sense. This person is struggling mentally and doesn't know why he's struggling. We need professional Christian care to come alongside and figure out how this works and what should we do, etc. And um, And... A proper way of administering and caring for mental care opens up, though our agenda is never that, you know, you should convert, 
opens up a tremendous door for them to understand the love of Christ, mm-hmm. which, which we have not imagined. That you've got a God who's, acceptant, who's accepting you in the midst of whoever you are and whatever struggle you are. You're not, something is not intrinsically wrong with you, and, you know, and God still cares for you and loves you. Those are not things that are brought into the counseling process by many people you know, in, in dealing with these uh, issues. But, and I'm saying this because we have a large health work in the nation and p- among children and women, and we're constantly dealing with mental health issues. Yeah, uh, it, it seems to me, in my journeys like around the world, and I want, I want to hear your, your, um, your response, uh, Dr. Clinton, to what Bishop said and also this, but like, we have a massive, massive mental health crisis among young people, like every, everywhere. The, you know, the, the COVID generation that, uh, uh, you know, I was watching the horrible um, anti-Semitic protests on uh, Columbia's campus this spring, and they canceled commencement. This is the same generation uh, of college graduates whose high school commencement was canceled. Like every country I go to, every place I go to, young people are in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, how, how do you think of that, Dr. Clinton, and what should we do about it? You saw a CDC report that came out not long ago talking about um, our daughters and our granddaughters here in the United States. Here's what the CDC reported. 57% of our daughters and our granddaughters felt persistently sad. Hmm. In other words, they were struggling with feelings of, Um, depression, even despair. Uh, They went on to say in that same report that 30% of our daughters and our granddaughters here in the United States had seriously contemplated suicide. Now, let me say something. Johnny, we don't have a crisis here. We've got, we've got an absolute disaster. Epidemic. And there are a lot of factors that are feeding this. And I think we're, we're, we're turning a blind eye to it. We're like kids. You remember when you were a kid and you rode on your bicycle, you would try to close your eyes for a little bit and pedal, see how long you keep them closed. I think that's how the church is. I think that's where culture is right now. We're closing our eyes thinking that it's all going to go away when we open our eyes. It's not going away. We're still on the bike. We're still going. And I'm telling you what, we're headed for a cliff is where we're at. We're in a total disaster. Loneliness has become a a serious problem. 61% of those 18 to 25 reported high levels of loneliness. By the way, coupled with, and you start throwing in anxiety uh, symptoms and depression symptoms, you've got, you know, this this concoction for disaster. And so in the midst of it, I'm reminded of Mother Teresa. Everybody knows of her, her, her care for the poor. But listen to the statement. She once said the most terrible poverty is loneliness mm. and the feeling of being unloved. We're living in a terrible a world that's so messed up. We're so broken. We're so broken at home. We're so broken in our, our relationships with our children and more that they're turning to devices to, quote, you know, um, calm or soothe themselves, which, by the way, only the algorithms are just targeting them even more. So if they look up a word like um, um, sad or depression or suicide, then they're getting blitzed by the algorithms. And these phones absolutely are tormenting. That's what my thing. They're tormenting our kids at a whole nother level, only fueling this disaster. And we're not winning. We're losing. We're losing. We're losing our kids. Our boys, for example, are in an absolute crisis right now. We had better we had better wake up to this nightmare sooner than later. And we need to stop turning a blind eye to this mental health crisis. I personally believe that mental health has become one of, if not the greatest issues, facing the church worldwide, globally. I agree. I and, fully and if agree. We don't, if we don't step up into this, you know what? Nature hates a vacuum, and so does a child's soul. And if we don't rush to fill it with noble, the noble, Bill Bennett said, if we don't rush to, I think, fill it with the noble sentiments of virtue, character, and so much more, it will be filled with something else. And by the way, it is. Every kid deserves to know that they're loved by their mom and dad and more. Even more than that, they need to be showered with it. Every kid needs to know that 
They have someone in their life that's crazy about them. Here's the beauty. I'm connecting this back. The beauty of what we offer from a Christian faith-based perspective for a moment is in the midst of that, guess what? God loves you. Tim, God loves you. I don't know if you know that or not. Virtually every man I've ever met doesn't really believe that God loves him. But if we could solve that piece, that's why we don't go into third world countries, you know, trying to, quote, just drop a bunch of rules. I mean, we want to go in there with a cup of water, a message of love. Listen, I want to tell you the greatest story in the whole world, who Jesus is and what he really means and what he can do for your heart, for your soul. And if you would just, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, the scriptures say, but the ends thereof are the ways of death and brokenness. It's not about the darkness. It's about the light. Tim, get the light. Tim, I'm going to interrupt you because uh, we have done a lot of podcast interviews, but you are in the counseling world. You know, I, I, I work with the people called the Dalits, the untouchables. Uh, there are 300 million of them who, through the caste system uh, coming out of the Vedas, have been told that they have been such hopeless, horrible sinners in a past life that God determined that in this life they will be born as untouchables, less than human, less life having, their life having less value than the life of a cow. And being put into the most menial, dirty jobs and then being exploited for nearly 2,000 years. Get this, nearly 2,000 years. And what it has done to their psychological makeup over 2,000 years. When you're told you're less than human and you're dehumanized by society, uh, every village is two villages. We have an apartheid system in India which nobody talks about. They cannot go and draw water from the well that the upper caste use because if they go and draw the water from the upper caste well, uh, the upper caste get polluted. Their shadow cannot fall on our upper caste because the upper caste gets polluted. So anyway, children have been raised with this. And and two issues have come. And we are involved in major evolution. One is when we asked the Dalits, what do you want us to do? The first thing they said, save our children. And... Uh, and as Christians, I didn't understand what they were asking for. They said, no, we want you to open centers of education, English medium, etc. Start with 100, have thousands. But when our kids come there, they must know they're made in the image of God. God loves them. And in word and practice and all, they cannot be treated as untouchables. So we've been doing that to see how we changes the psychological, because they said by the time we are 8, 10, 15, it's over. It's in our head, and this human slavery will never go through our life. The women, mainly because they are exploited, raped, and sold in the market, so they are the supreme sex-trafficked people. Thirdly, and the reason I'm bringing it to you, Tim, and I, it has caused me huge issues, and I've moved away from it. And they say, very category, please don't tell me I'm a sinner. We don't want to talk about the subject of sin. Sin has destroyed our civilization. This talk, uh, the upper caste have said, we are sinners born in a uh, uh, sinner's past life, this life and all. Tell us if you have a gospel that tells us we are not born sinners, but we are born uh, as God's children. Now, in, in my situation, uh, it, it, and I have done it the old way, and I do it this new way for 25 years. I didn't get any fruit or anything because I was telling them something that they hated every time. I told them, you know, we are sinners and God, and they just said, this is not the gospel. This is what the Brahmins have been telling us for 2,000 years. So now it created for me a theological problem, it created for me a lot of problems in saying, how do I deal with a nation where sin language is seen as a curse? Not about right and wrong. We are being 
put into this and our mental health goes for a toss when all that we hear day and night is we are sinners. So it may, for a Christian civilization, it may never mean anything. You know, you're a sinner, four spiritual laws and all of that. It doesn't work. And so, you know, what I'm saying is see the root of the problem is they're not born, more born sinners than any of us, but society has brainwashed them into believing they are being punished, they're hated by God because they are sinners. What, what is, and Dr. Clinton, we could talk to you for, <laughs> for, for days, and this is a, uh, an, an incredible, um, uh, and Bishop, like usual, you're sort of like blowing up my mind with this, but I'm just curious what goes on in the mind of someone um, who is uh, born untouchable, uh, who's been told this for like years and years and years and years, like you are nothing, you are nothing, you are nothing, you know, in a past life, you did all these horrible things. And so you're destined to this, like, you know, it's one thing Bishop looks at it, you know, as an Indian Christian leader, I look at it, someone totally from the outside, governmental people look at that as like human rights and social justice and all of this. How does a psychologist, a counselor view that problem? Johnny, we have a saying, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. In other words, what are you giving priority to in your thought life? What are you giving your heart to? In 1 John 5, uh, I think 20, 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. In other words, what are you surrendering your life to? And Bishop... um, we can begin to get caught up in a way of life that our brain actually, we're learning this now in interpersonal neuroscience, um, that study of the mind, that you can develop rutting in your brain, pathways, and it's easy to get locked into your ruts. It's like a, I grew up on a farm as a boy, and when a tractor gets into that spring mud and gets down in deep, and, and, and you can get that tractor buried in the mud and it's hard to get that tractor out I think people can get caught up in a way of life where they're oppressed they live in oppression uh, again violence abuse and so much more that they lose their sense of safety stability saneness and more and it's not easily broken I do know this um, I believe that the Bible says it's the love of God that constrains us yes indeed It's the love of God that changes everything. Again, it's not about the darkness. It's about the light. Um, Are we enamored with and overwhelmed by the light? And then when people see us, do we bring that encounter into those dark places? You know, that uh, counseling we often refer to as listening and being empathetic. In other words, listening means um, can you uh, go into those places where you understand what's being said and what isn't being said, and then being empathetic is literally, can you enter into the fellowship of their suffering? In other words, do you go into the dark places and be touched by them so that you can bring light into the darkness? And that means it's very difficult, um, very sobering, very challenging, very threatening kind of work if we're to do God's work. But yet, we don't go alone. We go with the one who has overcome. Yeah, and who, who, who has uh, suffered like no one else. And it went to the lepers. I mean, that's, you know, I, I think that's the amazing thing. Like, for sure, um, those who had leprosy in the New Testament were the untouchables of their time. And the beauty of what Jesus did was, um, though I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, we have, know what's in the New Testament. I don't know what he said that we don't know, you know, that wasn't recorded uh, and and ultimately in, in, God, in God's word, but I have to believe that um, those condemned people uh, in the end felt that the message of Jesus was something that gave them new life for real. And we live in this funny time of history. Maybe it's like this in all of history, where um, uh, uh, well, the righteous people feel like they're okay, and the unrighteous people. They feel it, and it piles on top of them when you say, you know, you've done all these things wrong. And yet Jesus cuts through all of that. But how did he do it? 
we have in the New Testament, we have far more of what Jesus did than what he said. And even when he spoke, he told these parables, which are exactly what you're saying, Dr. Clinton. They were empathetic. You felt what he was preaching because you knew he understood you. And I think that's the power of this conversation. That's why mental health is so important. Uh, and you've, um, uh, you've, you've guided us uh, today in the, in, the, in the right direction. You live it every day, Bishop, in India. Um, Dr. Clinton, I, I'm just wondering if you have any final word or two uh, to leave with us. Um, what, what should we be doing uh, in order to uh, improve the in, improve the mental health of of the believers sitting in our pews and our churches, Paul said these words: "He's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, so that we in turn can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves are comforted by God." The best way this gets dealt with, maybe changed is through each and every one of us, that God has called us all to a ministry of soul care. I don't care what your occupation is. God has no greater plan than to use people like you and me. That's, a, that's being purposeful. That's realizing that it's not about me in this life. It's really about God and his grace in our lives and through our lives. And so uh, that's what I want to bring. I want to bring grace and truth. And that's what they said about Jesus, that he came full of what? Grace and truth. Thank you, Dr. Clinton. Thank you very much. Uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Dr. Clinton is really a pioneer when it comes to Christian influence and mental health. Uh, The American Association of Christian Counselors has done more than any organization in the United States to uh, inspire many tens of thousands of counselors and to get counseling in churches and to make it okay for Christians to be medically trained, to become psychiatrists and all, all these things and licensed and all the details that go around it, getting licensed, maintaining your license, all of these things. And yet for all of that work, um, it feels like a drop in the bucket because there is no greater crisis in the world than the mental health crisis in our world. And the church is not excluded. It affects the church as much as it affects everyone else. If we had as many Tim Clintons and counselors in the global church as we have thrust as missionaries to preach the gospel, the, the story of the world would have been different. So not understanding mental health down to the centuries has been a huge blind spot. And now that we have people coming out and the association being born, etc., and I live with it, and I know what it is. And uh, there is no simple answer. There is insight, there is counseling, there is medication. And uh, Christians are not shielded from it, which is now what some of these major Christian leaders are understanding. I mean, bipolar disease can kill a believer. And we can't say just because somebody took their life away and committed suicide, they're going to go to hell. No, they're not going to go to hell. You don't even know what the pain a bipolar disease brings. But people think something like happened. There's a problem with the pastor. There's a problem with the family. The family is responsible because of this. And so we like simplistic answers, uh, which, 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 which we are not going to get. And then when you have... A son and a, and I was I have a friend whom I'm de, you know involved with, and they have a son who is teenager going to depression, very difficult to study and all. Their their bigger problem is not dealing with the problem of the son and take care of him. The problem is how to face their friends and societies, who just, just don't know how to relate to this. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think if there's one word to describe the world we're living in now, it's the word traumatized all the wars all the refugee crisis all the you know the pandemic all the financial crises around the world like and then and you put in the top of a traumatized world uh, the role of the internet uh, where it used to be if you had a bully at school you knew at least you were going home once a day but now it follows you on the internet and if there's anything we need to take more seriously as christians uh, it's it's this area and so our, our conversation today with dr clinton was um uh, a good one and just and just a start there's nothing more important than this if we're if we're going to try to 
you know, make sense of the world, um, man, we got to make we got to make sense of this of this issue. And sometimes we should have on uh, um, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Anxious uh, Generation. Um, it's an amazing, amazing book. I, I'm concerned about all the girls who are having severe mental problems because of the sexual culture that is thrown at them. I think we're, we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to maybe do a whole season where every episode is going to deal with a different issue. We'll get a world expert. We're going to help people um, not only find the help that they need, uh, but become uh, people who aren't only help themselves, but are using what they've learned to help other people. Thank you for joining us today for Babel Undone. If this conversation had you thinking, then why don't you share it with someone else? For more episodes of Babel Undone or other amazing content that helps Christians live out their faith, you should head over to premiere.plus. That's premiere, P-R-E-M-I-E-R, for the Americans listening in, dot plus. 